Okay, we're, we're live. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate your patience. Uh, we are, as you can see, uh, trying to incorporate technology, as, as some of you are aware, to our meetings and uh, live streaming them uh, to uh, our members, should they choose. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes it takes a little while to get working with this, I don't know. So anyway, uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, we really appreciate you coming. And uh, just a little bit of information at the beginning about this meeting. Uh, so, yeah, what we're going to try and do is just put a little bit of uh, a little bit of information uh, on uh, on where we are and who we are. As I'm sure most of you know, we are a branch of the Ontario Genealogical Society, and uh, there are many benefits to joining the provincial GS. As indicated here, I'm sure most of you are familiar with those benefits. Um, so it's a matter of changing time now. We're moving into a new uh, year. So if you have a membership, you probably have received notification that it, it's up for renewal. So it's, if it is, uh, you can go to the OGS website and, and renew that, uh, that membership online if you wish to do so. If you need to connect online, here are the websites that uh, for the OGS itself. This is a provincial uh, office at the top, and our own Essex branch uh, website is shown at the bottom. And uh, if you're into Facebook, we do have Facebook groups as well. So, okay, which one seems to apply to you? This is very true. We are coming to the end of the year, uh, and uh, time next meeting we will be having uh, elections for officers for the coming year. Uh, besides that, we do need volunteers. Uh, there are many act activities that we do uh, from month to month that uh, really could use somebody who might have a couple of hours to spare from time to time to uh, help out with the. Uh, some of the activities that we, we do undertake. So uh, if you can do that, uh, please uh, get in touch with us. Or if you're here before you leave tonight, if you want to, uh, to uh, offer your services, that's free. A um, couple of ones that might be of interest to you uh, in the area. Uh, tomorrow night in Sarnia, uh, there is uh, the Sarnia War Memorial Project which uh, if you can't make it, but are interested, uh, it is going to be live streamed on their website tomorrow. And uh, on the 13th, later this week, uh, Kent Branch uh, has a presentation, the more it is a will, uh, it's going to be provided as well by Deborah Honor uh, for their branch meeting for November. So uh, keep in touch with the, the various websites and, uh, and as they say, the reason for doing this uh, in terms of uh, keeping in touch on the websites are the fact that we are dealing with uh, we're dealing with circumstances where I would say about 75 percent of our members do not live in the Windsor area so uh, it's useful to have it live stream so they can see what's taking place in the Windsor branch or this county branch uh, each month and uh, we, we really would like to uh, welcome them tonight as well to, to, the, uh, to the meeting. Uh, tonight, or to November the 26th, uh, the heirs, the Harrow River Immigrant Research Society has a presentation called Remember When, uh, and uh, information on that can be obtained from them. And again, their website is, uh, is shown, and that would be on the, at 1.30, at the Harold Colchester Arena. So lots of activity going on, uh, no problem. Um, in terms of okay. Um back, I can get back that up for just a bit. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't realize that was in there. Uh, 
the Essex County, uh, we're talking, of course, uh, this meeting uh, every November uh, relates a program to uh, Remembrance Day, and we're very pleased to have uh, this con the uh, efforts continue tonight. We'll talk more about that momentarily. But things that uh, you might be interested in as uh, in doing family research, uh, the Essex Cottage Regiment Casualty List from World War II uh, is available. If you have ancestors that, that uh, did uh, serve in World War II, that's available. And all of these bits of information are available on the, on the website. Uh, military record access uh, uh, in featured collections is available on Ancestry as well. Uh, and more uh, on uh, Dick Eastman's blog, which is shown there as well. So, uh, the Library and Archives Canada is a source, which I'm sure people know in terms of military heritage records as well. So. Tonight's presentation, as I said, is going to continue the uh, tradition of uh, relating uh, November uh, to uh, Remembrance Day, because I'm sure nowhere, somewhere in our past, in our family's past, uh, there have been members of our uh, families who have served and perhaps perished uh, in one or two, one or one of the or both of the uh, the world conflicts. We welcome Ted Steele and Richard Herman from Ayers uh, to talk about the forgotten heroes of uh, World War II. And uh, so at this point, I would invite Ted or Richard, Richard first, okay, to uh, please come and share their stories with us. Thank you. When we decided to do this, all the forgotten heroes, it came out about two years ago. We tried to do a history program with the high school, a high school kids, and most of the students that came in were grade 10, grade 11 students. And we started to show a video of Binary Ridge, and the reaction was, we've seen that. We're not interested in that. That's old stuff. Tell us something interesting. Thank goodness we had done a whole lot of research on what's going on with the families. Ladies of Zip Gallery, Daughters of the Empire, and Harold and Kolchak are south. So we started relating what they were doing and how they were sending things over. Local families, the seven men who in Harold were died in the First World War. I do mainly the First World War, did as the Second World War. You're so and much older than me. <laughs> They found that a lot more interesting than they did what the school board says the curriculum is in the videos that they have to watch of Biden Bridge, Boston, and rest of them. I recently had a conversation with my nephew, who's in grade nine in Amherstburg. I said, what are you doing in history? World War II. We did World War I. The teacher gave us a test. We were lucky. I was lucky I got 59 on it, but I really didn't care one way or the other. So I just off the top of my head, I said, well, did you talk about Lieutenant Colonel John McCray? No. I said, you did? No. I said, okay, when you go back to school on Monday, and you're in your history class, ask your teacher if she knows what the name of his horse was. Guarantee if she hasn't done her research, she won't be able to tell you. And you keep her looking at me. His horse's name was Bonfire. He had a big black Newfoundland dog, and it was called Bono. The horse went overseas with him when he went from Guelph and came back to Guelph after the funeral. So that, that, and that's what the kids are interested in. I've got a whole lot of information, but that's not one of the things I was going to talk about tonight. If you notice when you came in, there's pictures back there, and it's called the Canadian Overseas Railway Construction Corps. And when you ask most people about it, most people don't know that Canada was very, very involved in the railroad construction, especially through France and Belgium 
in a First World War. And what had happened was in 1915, they were asked, Canada was asked by the British War Office to provide men with railway experience. 500 men were selected by the Canadian Pacific Railway from across the country. And by the spring of 1915, they were working in France and Belgium. In 1917, at Miami Ridge, they had installed over six used to supply ammunition to evacuate the wounded, and they transported 2,000 tons of food to the lines. And some of the pictures back there, you can see the narrow gate taking supplies, ammunition, and bringing the wounded back to the, behind the lines where they could get them back and get them out and get them to the hospital. In 1918, the Corps had already laid 1,400 miles of 1,200 miles of standard gauge, and by the end of the war, they numbered 19,000 men, 190 men, and they lost 1,977 men. In 1919, the Corps continued to maintain the lines until January the 24th, when they were relieved and they were demobilized on February the 1st and returned to Canada. This is a story that I found that goes along with it, and that's how I got involved in railroad. As I was going through it, I found this <clears throat> story about a man, and it was called "Royalty Never Forgets." Harry Smith was an engineer with the Canadian Railway during World War I. His job at Boschendale was to get the shells and ammunition to the front line. He was an engineer on a steam train, and they only ran at night because they were very, very visible during the daytime with the steam and the smoke coming up. So they used smaller kerosene, gasoline, whatever they could get smaller engines on the narrow gauge, and only ran the full-size steam engines at night. The trains ran while being shelled, having to replace and repair attack lines, but still, the deliveries got through and were made to the front lines every night. After the Battle of Boschendale, Henry was awarded the Military Cross. He was supposed to report to the Canadian military headquarters to receive his medal in London, England. But when the Germans broke through the British lines in March of 1918, he felt it was his duty to stay on the job to get the Canadian troops, the machine gunners, the motorized cavalry, etc., the railway troops in to help maintain line and hold their position. His main job was to evacuate the wounded from the field hospitals and the dressing station and try to save as many men as possible. Working at top speed one evening, he was called to answer the phone. He picked the phone up and he said, Captain Smith, maybe. The reply was, Wales here. How are you getting along, Smith? Smith's reply was, it'd be a damn sight faster if I didn't have to answer the phone. <laughs> About an hour later again, trying to get the wounded loaded onto the, and you can see some of the pictures back there of the railway trails, train cars that were set up as nursing cars with uh, bunks and stuff in the men. Again, the phone rang. Smith was called back again. He were Wales here again. When will the train be leaving? Oh, go to hell. I haven't time to put up with this. A few days later, he received orders to report to the 5th Army headquarters, where he met Seth senior office and Captain Wales. Harry was standing there, shaking hands and facing the Prince of Wales. After the war ended, Harry returned home to Perry Owen Sound, 
And the Prince of Wales made a trip to Canada in 1919, spring of 1919, representing the king and the royal family. It was announced at that time that any veteran who had not received his decorations or medals could send his name to the prince and they would be awarded on <clears throat> at a ceremony to be held in Hamilton. In Owen Sound, Harry's father finally convinced him to attend the ceremony. And on the day of the prince's visit, he was greeted by a huge crowd. As the veterans' names were being called in the course of an alphabetic order, they mounted the dais where the prince pinned on their medals and decorations. At last, Harry's name was called. He marched proudly up to the dais, saluted the prince. The prince showed no sign of recognition while he pinned the purple and white ribbon with the military cross to Harry's tunic. The prince then smiled, shook his hand, then leaned forward and whispered, go to hell, Smith. <laughs> Another one that I found that was very interesting, and this one is called Maragat's Gang. These are four young men who went into the armed service together in World War I. Maragat, Hawkins, Bobian, and Brown were their last names. It said they did everything together. They marched four abreast when they were in training. They Eight slept, infiltrated behind men enemy lines as a gang. At one point, they had outflanked a pair of German machine guns. They cut telephone lines, used a catapult to launch flares a greater distance from the front line so that the German fell short, thinking that they were actually closer than they were. At one other occasion, they had taken over a very large gun, shortened the fuses on the shells, and started shooting at German aircraft. A major in the company learned of their exploits and designated the gang as raiders. They were excused from duty on the front lines, even though they were in and out and across the front lines and behind enemy lines all the time. One evening, headquarters sent a notification down to the Major that they needed a German to interrogate, and the Major's unit was given the job. The Major called Marigat's gang to the headquarters, given the order to capture a German prisoner alive. They found a place in the barbed wire that was about 20 feet across, and we're trying to figure out how they could get through the barbed wire to get to where the Germans were. They came up with the idea, and this is Canadian ingenuity. A nearby town had been very badly shelled, but they came up with the idea that they needed some kind of a long trench bomb, if you want to call it that. So they went back into the town and they found a piece of pipe approximately 30 feet long, capped one end, filled it with ammonite, put a fuse in the air, three of them went out and managed to shove it under the barbed wire. Brown, who had stayed behind, crawled out to where they were on the barbed wire with a lit cigarette backwards in his mouth so they could not see the ember from the cigarette and lit the fuse. When it went off, they had a trench 30 feet across and two feet deep that they could crawl underneath the barbed wire. They made it through. They captured a German soldier and returned him safely to the Major's headquarters. The Major asked them, they said, is this man all right? And one of them replied, well, we just zapped him a little bit to knock him out so he wouldn't give us a problem. And as he was sitting there and kind of dazed, he said that he was glad that he had been captured by the German, by the Canadians. And the major took out a bottle of whiskey and set five glasses on the corner of his desk. 
and poured five glasses of whiskey and the men were thinking, okay, one for us and one for him. No, the Piflin was for the German and he said to him, I think you need this more than I do. <laughs> he was then taken by another group of men back to the 5th Army headquarters where he was per further interrogated. I'm kind of keeping an eye on the time because I know Ted's got a good presentation and <clears throat> the one we just I recently did with Colonel John McRae, and I'll, I'll make this one real quick. I won't go into a lot of the whole DOTs on it. Most of us all understand, you know, that he was a doctor, and that was his medical background. We just did our heirs meeting, and at the heirs meeting, this is the one I did on his military history. And he has, does have quite a military history. His father was a brigadier general. His whole family was very military oriented, and uncles, cousins, relatives. In 1886, at the age of 14, he was <clears throat> a member of the Highfield Cadet Corps in Guelph. 1890, he was a member of the number two battery in Guelph. 1891, he was appointed quartermaster sergeant. 93, he was second lieutenant. In 86, he was promoted to lieutenant. He was also a captain of the Queen's Old Rifles in Canada while still attending university. 1899, he was a captain with the Gulf Artillery Battle, part of D Battery of the Canadian Field Artillery. And he also served in the Boer War. In 1904, he resigned from the Canadian Army after having been promoted to the rank of Major. And he really had nothing more to do until 1914 when he re-enlisted. And then that time, ten year time period is when you find out a lot of his medical history in all the different hospitals, setting up his own practice and stuff. And it, he, he was very, very highly regarded as, as a physician and a doctor, which we all understand and know from that history. In 1914, he enlisted as a brigade surgeon of the 1st Brigade Canadian Field Artillery, rank of major, and was second in command. In 1915, he lost his very close friend, Lieutenant Alex Hammer, Helmer, and that was when he wrote in Flanders Field on May the 3rd. A few days after having written that poem, he was transferred to the 3rd Canadian General Hospital in France as Chief of Medical Services. 1916, he was in charge of a 1,560-bed facility located on 26 acres at Dons Camier near Boulogne, France. All during this time, he continued to live in a tent as his men in the field did. And when his superior officers realized it was starting to affect his health, he was ordered to stay in warmer and drier accommodations. And he had suffered from asthma and bouts of pneumonia ever since he was a young child, even when he was a teenager and stuff, and he was still having those problems. To escape the losses and the suffering that he was seeing every day, he would take long rides across the French countryside on his horse bonfire. Today we would say that is the way the men today are trying to cope with the trauma and the problems they're having when they come back. Again, during the summer of 1917, he had another very, very severe bout of asthma and bronchitis. In January of 1918, he was sick with pneumonia. He was moved to the number 14 British General Hospital for officers. On January the 24th, he was appointed consulting physician to the 1st British Army, the 1st Canadian and non-British and non officer to be so honored. Unfortunately, four days later, on January the 24th, he passed away. He was buried with full military honors at Wimmero Cemetery near Malone, France. That's 
My talk on the First World War, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. There is one website, if anyone is interested, that I ran across. And I can leave the paper here with Jim if you want. It's entitled William Redbird Stark, Life on the Lines with the 1st Battalion of the Canadian Railway Troops. And it's 14 sketchbooks, which are watercolor and pencil sketches of the area in France and Belgium that he served in. And there's probably 10 to 12 pages in each book. So with that, I'll turn the meeting over to Tim. Thank you. My turn. Am I standing here all right? I like to roam around in my classroom. I used to sit on the desk and didn't stand still, but I'll try to be good today. Do we have our slideshow ready to go? Mm -hmm. Wonderful technology has come through for us. Maybe. No, no. Uh, you still have to operate yours, sorry. Oh, I do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought you had it up over there. Oh, I do. Okay. <laughs> We're with AIRS, the uh, Herald Early Immigrant Research Society. We do genealogy, family trees, and history. I'm not from Essex County, so the genealogy around here, eh, I'm from Ted County, Chatham specifically. But my thing is history, that so we fit together very nicely. And the local history around here is amazing. And so that's my contribution to the group. Richard does research and knows people around here like crazy. However, oh. here with me. We're trying to run two systems here, and they don't always coincide. That's the problem. Okay. Open. And we want to do that. Okay, there's what we do. And one of our current projects over the last year is to publicize Hollow Island. Blockhouse. Most people don't even know there is one, but there certainly is. This was it in 2011. It was falling down. It was full of growth inside. Uh, the, the jungle had just about taken over, and at some point, there's a very real possibility, you can see the V in the roof, that some machinery kind of sped up its destruction. It was in very bad shape until a fella came along and said, gee, we need to do something about this. And his name was Bill Brundage. And he looked it over and said, we just can't allow this to disappear on us, which it was going to do. That's the front door. And you can see how rotten the logs are. And Bill went to the owner of the island, Dominic Amaconi, and he said, well, I don't care about it. He went to people in Amherstburg and they said, well, we don't really care. It's not our problem. And he eventually got in contact with a fella named Norm Becker. And Norm Becker is an engineer. He said, yeah, I care. Maybe. Would be nice. You're right. Thank you. Okay. This is Bill Brundage and his wife. And at this point, you can see here it's 2011. They had decided to do something, and Norm Becker is a community-minded individual. He's here, runs company. He's got the finances and the know-how, and he shared Bill's interest. Fortunately, fortunately, as Bill said, two weeks away from work. He's right. They took it apart. Took it, well, they took it completely apart. But eighty percent of the wood was no good at all. What did he say? It had no foundation, it was sitting on the ground, and you can imagine sunk in and everything else. So they took it apart, numbered the logs, and measured all the specifications and put in a foundation for it to sit on. So it's up off the ground now, which it wasn't originally. 
and they began restoring it. You're not going to find timber like this around here. Northern Ontario does have it. Norm Becker had helped one of the native Indian groups to found a lumbering industry above Lake Superior. They owed him a favor or two. So they provided the lumber that was needed. They also sent down some of the Indian craftsmen to do the work. So they repaid Norm Becker's debt. And this is the result. And this is like. Now, Bill Brundage, the guy who started all this, is the guy front door. Fort Malden? No. They contributed smaller amounts. 90% of it was contributed by Norm Becker. So Bill Brundage goes over on Sundays, more often through the nice weather, and keeps it open for visitors. What Ayers has done is promote that. It is one of a kind. Another activity uh, is very good on these stories. I don't know how much time he spends on the internet, but he certainly finds good stuff. We also have people donate. They have a lady behind a big pile of newspapers from the 1940s. They were falling apart. They were old and yellow and brittle. And I went through and managed to save some of the articles. And here are some of the soldiers who were heading home from World War II. These are a collection of ones from Chatham and Amherstburg and Sarnia and Harrow. Quite a file. Come on, beast. Now it doesn't want to move up. Uh, so. Now it doesn't want to do anything. Okay. Struggling. May 1944, the day written on, and this is one of the local guys, uh, Westland from Olette Avenue. Here is uh, Captain Millen of Winter. He was a surgeon. And I thought family members would like to get a hold of these. We have a whole pile of these now, and some other interesting things that were in the papers. So another thing we do is collect and preserve. We're not a museum. We can't be. But computer files, photos, and so on, yes, we can. Come on, machine, move up. Don't you click it again. Yeah. OK. Uh, Vera and Margaret Stevenson, two girls for winter in the Air Force. The women served, too, of course. Now, this is where we get into the historical aspect. I want to talk about the stories that we should know about and we don't. They've just been overlooked. This is 1814, the end of the 1814 war. There was a huge battle, I believe it was in Maine. A lot of casualties on both sides. The Americans graciously offered to have the, the Canadians who had been killed in the battle buried along with their soldiers in their cemetery. So it was a gesture of gallantry. As the war wound down, they could see the other guys are all right, too. There wasn't the hatred that needs to be in war, or that seems to be, I should say. Click it again. I, <laughs> no? OK. <laughs> For one, there was something that was totally overlooked. Newfoundland was not a part of Canada. They enlisted a battalion of over 500 soldiers, and off they went to France. And in one battle, 80% of them were killed. An entire generation of Newfoundland young men. They charged into machine guns and were just wiped out. Instead of 545, I think it was, the next day there was something like uh, 51 that answered roll call. They did their part. It's not even talked about. There is a special cemetery and a monument for that, as there should be. In World War I, there was a truce. You hear rumors of this. There was. It didn't last too long. The soldiers on both sides gradually put their guns and celebrate Christmas. Now, there are some stories that are going to bring you 
time, I'm going to skip over them. There they're bringing in some mistletoe to decorations. Good luck decorating that. Here they say they sang songs back and forth, Christmas carols. The Germans would sing one and come back from the Allied side with another, and they had a real good sing song. In fact, sometimes they would throw cans of meat over at each other and exchange items. Not often, but it did happen. This guy says uh, the one got up and there's a little lonely trench. And they were singing Silent Night in German. There was humanity guides and we for that. Now, as I said, there was a truce, but the officers were worried. How am I going to party with the guy today and shoot at him tomorrow? Difficult. So they decided, stop that. We let him back here. If you know him, he's from Monty Python. Anytime they got into a skit that was developing into too much, he would appear to get down. This is the house where Adolf Hitler was born. And his mother and father. And Adolf Hitler served as a corporal in World War I. And he came out of the Allies, which manifested itself later. When Hitler got the power, the Jews, he was a smart guy. He realized, I can get everybody on my side if we all hate the same person. They made a campaign so that everybody would hate the Jews. Oh, if I hate them and you hate them, we're on the same side. Here the Jews are cleaning the street with toothbrushes. Well, everybody else stands around and laughs and calls them names. German concentration camp where they took huge rocks and broke them into smaller rocks. The whole day until they died. That was the idea. Work them to death. They didn't need the stones. They just trains from every European country under German occupation went back and forth to Poland carrying Jews. Here's a cattle car. Load the people on. Send them to Poland to the concentration camps. Through the 30s, this was going on, and it began to bother some people. The Leica Camper Company in Germany, top notch equipment. Well, they not only made very good cameras, they also made rangefinders and telescopes and rifle scopes and that sort of thing that Hitler needed. So he kind of left them alone as long as they made the products he needed. And the Leica family knew what was happening and they decided we got to do something about this. We can't let it go. So what they did is they organized their company and stopped it with a lot of Jewish workers. And then they would open a branch in Paris and send their Jewish executives there. They'd open one in London, send them there, send a bunch to New York. They managed to get a lot of the workers who were Jewish out of Germany. Eventually, about 1936, the Germans saw what was going on and they shut this down. The family was persecuted somewhat. A few members were jailed and there was a heavy fine. And they chose not to have this talked about until the last members who were involved died, which happened four or five years ago, I believe. I hadn't heard it until about two years ago. We all know Schindler's List, famous movie, and based on a real guy. And the real guy is quite interesting. There's Oscar. The third in the factory, he was making munitions for the Germans, and the Nazis, of course, needed lots of Nazis. He was a member of the Nazi party. That is him right in the middle. He, he ran his factory, and he loved making it all He had a conscience. Eventually, he saw things like this. Gypsy Tilden rounded up and sent off to Auschwitz. His conscience bothered him. He went towards the gas chamber with three little children. They can't do any work. They're of no value. They go. Schindler was a decent man. He decided that as much as he could, he would hire Jewish workers and bring them onto his factory grounds, get them out of the city, and they would be prepared. These are working for you. I need these people to keep my factory running. And he was able to save a large number, again, of adults. 
Adults, it was very difficult to get out of Germany at this time. We were able to save a considerable number. And he, at the end of the war, went off to uh, Argentina, but he eventually came back and uh, his role was understood and he was forgiven. This is his grave. It's in a Jewish cemetery. The stones represent someone who's come to pay him honor, to someone on the grave, to indicate you were there, to honor that person. They regularly have to sweep the stones off his grave. The Jewish community remembers Oscar Schindler. In the 1930s, the Nazis were toughening up on adults, but children were in the way. They won. A group organized the kinder transport to get the children out of Germany. The parents would have to give up the kids and turn them over to an agency which would put them on a boat or a train and get them out of Germany. The eventual goal was to place them with homes in London, England, even here in Canada, to get the kids away from the Nazis. A lot of my material from the little kids. She doesn't know where she's going. She doesn't speak the language. Her parents gave her to these people and said, here, you take her. She hasn't a clue. Terrified. They have gotten off the boat and they are waiting to be processed, I guess we'd say, in probably London. The teenagers managed to get through. That was not common. Usually it was little kids. Anybody look for them, they hang on to. And adults, they didn't want to let go. Kids, ah, who cares? The boy waiting to be adopted, more or less. The plan was always to take them back to Germany and re reunite them with their family. But obviously, in most cases, it wouldn't happen. Little girl with a girl, she's not a stamp, 1939. Jewish children that are transport, probably train. The group went to England aboard the boat agreement, before it surrendered to Germany. So 1940, the kinder transport was shut down. They closed the borders, kids aren't getting away either. This fellow was a big wheel in organizing the kinder transport, Norbert Wolheim. He had accompanied them to various places and so on, and here in the Jewish community. He was taken to Auschwitz. His wife and young son were sent to That didn't matter. They were killed. He had, was selected for forced labor. Became a slave, in the, probably in the stone pits. This is one of the people who got away, thanks to the kinder transport. Uh, with cousins who had never met in 50 years, they both got out and they were reunited. Anybody know Irina Sandler? Probably not. I didn't until a couple of years ago. I heard a little bit of her story and I went to the public library. Great source. I recommend them so highly. Irina Sandler was a nurse in Poland. And when the Nazis rounded up all the Jews and put them in a pogrom, it's called, I believe, which is a slum area, and they built an 11 and a half foot high fence. Nobody in her own unless we say so. They were in a cage. Irina was a nurse, and she did not. I go in and I can help them and prevent plague and epidemics so that they don't, you guys don't get it. She thought that was a pretty good idea. Let's not let any disease break out. So they let her go in and come back each night. During World War II, Irina got permission to work in the Warsaw Ghetto. This says as a plumber sewer specialist. I think she was still a nurse in the health department, but sanitation. She had an ultimate. She smuggled in the bottom of the toolbox she carried. She also had a burlap sack in the back of her truck for larger kids. She was smuggling kids out in the ambulance, right under their noses. There's the people plugged them in there. There might have been space for let's say 5,000, and they crammed maybe 12,000 in. Didn't matter to them. Starving child. This is what was going on, and Irina was trying to do something. The kids could be saved. 
the Jardinas y Gangs. This is the book here, and I went through that, and it's fascinating. She was hiding the babies and sneaking them out. To make sure they didn't make any noise, sometimes they would be drugged. Also carried dogs in the ambulance, and the dogs were trained to bark if anybody in the uniform came near. Number one, Germans would come near the dogs. Number two, the barking covered up any noise the kids might make. She's pretty smart. Sneaking them out the ambulance, four or five a day maybe, over a period of a couple of years. Others, she found a network in the sewers, and she could help some of the teenagers to sneak through there and get out on the other side. And there were Polish families who would take them in and uh, take care of them. She wrote down the names of all the children she brought out so that they could be reunited at the end of the war with their families. Mother, father, the kid's name, and also where the kid went so that she could go and get that kid reunited. It would be dangerous to have that list around. So she hid them in a jar in her back, dug and tucked it away. If the Nazis found that, uh, they would go and get those babies and kill them and they killed her. Gestapo finally figured out she was up to something and they came charging in and around. She kept a dog in the back, I told you that. The soldiers wanted nothing to do with the dog. During her time of doing this, she managed to smuggle out and save 2,500 kids. And ultimately, she was caught. The Nazis broke both of her legs to make her talk. Where is this jar with the names? She wouldn't talk. They broke her arms, and she still wouldn't talk. And then they beat her up. Still wouldn't talk. She kept a record of all the names she had smuggled out in a glass jar under the tree. After the war, she tried to get any pair and tried to reunite the family. Most had been gassed. Those kids she helped got placed into foster family homes or adopted. This is a video, DVD, of her story. Doesn't get much publicity, but it is a great story, and she has just been overlooked by history. Almost. This is her tag. And the Star of David flag. About 2009, this was her. Life in a Jar is a book about her, which I've seen online. Age 32 and age 98. One more page I want to talk about. Oh, not that. Female Schindler, she's called. Say 2500. A book about. In 2007, Irina was put up for the Nobel Peace Prize. She was not selected. I want to a slideshow on global warming. Thank you for so much. And she is pretty much forgotten in history, which is a real shame. This is a young lady who was in a rebellion. They rose up and fought back against their captors. They caught her and as a what would you say? As an example to the others, they took her out into the main courtyard, brought the other prisoners around, and they hung her. And Frank, we've all heard of. There's a few pictures to go with that story. I won't go into it because there are a couple others to want to get. The middle of the class, 1934, maybe. Family shot. This is 1939. I believe they're in Belgium at this point, or Holland. This is where you see this is the front of the building and the business is there. Behind it is another building which nobody knew about. Now that case door, you can see in the top right, if you swing that door open, it's a set of stairs. This is when it, this is where family spent about 22 months, I believe. And they went in and rounded up the people and they found a book and one of them said, oh, childish scribble, and they threw it into the corner. War from Maria Van Frank. There it is. She's not going to get any more papers, so she had to use every bit. Young girl, 11, 12, 13, growing up, started to be interested in boys and wanting to be a teenager. 
This guy's hiding under the floorboards of a house. You've got some books, like people must be supplying him with enough food. Good looking fellow. Anne and Margot, her sister, had to leave their mother behind in Auschwitz. The two girls were transferred to Belgen Bergen or Bergen Belsen got backwards. The worst camp. Like Anne and Margot died a few weeks before the camp was liberated. Her father gave the book and his pages to the Netherlands, but he took out some pages about her boyfriend and everything like that. He thought they were too personal. After Otto died, they were put back in with the family's permission, so the book is now complete. Will Wallenberg is another person who was helping Jews get out of Nazi Germany. And he and his colleagues rescued at least 100,000 Jews from certain death, Budapest. He was arrested as a spy in 1945, taken off to prison by the Russians, and the Russians say he died in prison. We don't. Charlie Brown is a favorite of mine. We all know Snoopy was in World War I. Flying East. Well, Charlie Brown was in World War II. Not that Charlie This one. This Charlie Brown was a bomber pilot. And he flew a bombing run, dropped all his bombs from Germany, trying to get out of there. His plane was badly shot up. Half his crew was dead or wounded. How high he's flying, or how fast, or in what direction. He was just flying to get out of there. He's limping along at half speed. One of the four motors didn't work anymore. There he is. The tail's almost shot off. And he's trying to get home. You can see the second motor in from me isn't spinning. Looks out the window, and there's a Master Schmidt fighter. He thought, uh oh, we're dead. The didn't do anything. He flew along beside him for a little while, and it was flown by Franz, who was, and he came up and looked at the plane. He couldn't believe it was still in the air. He finally signaled to Charlie Brown. You're going the wrong way. Turn around. Charlie said, well, he could have shot me down any time he wanted. I got nothing to lose by believing him. So he turned the plane around. Stiegler escorted him back to the English Channel. Stiegler said, I shot him down over the English Channel. Charlie Brown and his crew told the order, never speak of this. We don't want to present the Germans as being even human. After the war, Charlie Brown tracked down Stiegler. They became friends. They died a few years ago. They were living in the same state in the United States. Ford, I think. This is uh, Stiegler changed his mission. He nodded at the American pilot and began flying in formation. German anti aircraft might shoot the bomber down. He flew his Messerschmitt there, so they think that was one of the German planes that they, the, the bomber that they captured, and it was actually flying a German mission. He protected it. A book, I've not seen this one either, I just came across it. It's out there. I'm going to look for it. Mark warriors, gallant warriors on both sides. He was fighting for Germany, he was not a Nazi. He knows her. She was in World War II. Hmm. Really? He was in the diplomatic corps. They were in Holland, I believe. Might have been, it doesn't matter. And when the Nazis invaded, they couldn't get up. So they remained some and Audrey would ride her bicycle around the town. And without the Germans being aware, she came from one underground group to another. One time she was stopped, and they were better in her and she thought, uh oh, I'm dead. There's a secret message there somewhere. And heaven knows what they'll do to me anyhow. Some kind of a commotion broke out, and the guards were called away, and she escaped through a sewer. Got out of there. She had a very close call. I went on to Hollywood, breakfast at Tiffany's, and all kinds of other features. But she didn't always have that charmed life. Well, she's charmed right there. She got away with it. Now, 
I was in the library, as I often am, in Kingsville, and they had a World War II display set up. And I saw this book on the shelf. I'd never heard of it. Candy Mom. What in the world? I can't think of a book that's, express, that's impressed me more. And that's not something I would say easily. Chocolate Bomber, Uncle Wiggle Wings, what the heck? Great story. Here's Germany, and right in the middle of Germany, you have Berlin, surrounded. And the Russians will not be happy. They want to starve the Berliners into joining Russia. They have no heat, no fuel, no food, no water, no nothing. The Allies decide the only way we can get food into Berlin, which is up there in the top, in the right corner, is by airlift. And they start flying in bombers full of food. And the bombers would come in and land. Guys with their uh, machinery would come out, unload the bomber, and he'd turn around and take off. He'd be back in a few hours. Another plane comes in. Same thing, unload it. This is going on all the time. One day, a fella stowed away he wanted to see what went on when the plane was being unloaded. So he stowed away while the plane was being unloaded. He noticed a group of kids over the fence. And he said, you know, those kids were all born during the last war. They probably never even had candy. A lot of them don't even have family anymore. They got nothing. He went over to talk to them, and he knew very little children. And he could converse with them. And after he talked with them, he started to come back, and he noticed he had two sticks of gum in his pocket. I believe it was really spearmint. So he took them out and broke them into bits and gave them to the kids. And they broke them into smaller bits and passed them around. And the kids who didn't get any of that got a little piece of the wrapper so they could smell it. He said to them, tell you what, kids, tomorrow when I come back, I'm going to bring some candy with me. I'm going to drop it on the airplane for you guys to get. And they all got pretty excited about that, but they said, there's hundreds of planes. How will we know which one is you? But when I come in, I'll wiggle my wings. Thus, Uncle Wiggle Wings. His plane come in, he'd do that. The kids would know, there's the plane, and run over to it. And he and his co-pilot would shovel candy bars with a little parachute on them, handkerchiefs, out the back. And they would float down to the ground. He would come in, and they would unload his plane as usual. And he turned around and started to take off, and he wondered, did they all go in the lake, or did they land on top of a building? Did any of the kids get the candy? As he was taxiing off the runway, all the kids were standing there waving their, their parachutes, saying, we got them. So he started doing this more and more, and he got all his rations for candy. He started to ask his friends if they would chip in. There's uh, family and kids. The families could not provide goodies for their kids. So Gail Halverson decided he would. And Gail and other pilots started giving him their candy and their handkerchiefs to make parachutes out of. And it started to become a big time job. This is the start of the Berlin Airlift. And I saw this as an ad on the internet. And the thing that really struck me is when nobody else would notice. But here one of the signs, it indicates this is the airfield that the candy bomber was coming into and taking off from. So it represented that particular site, and I had to have that. Here he is, Halverson with German A recreation, probably. Plane coming in, running for the bomb. This is definitely a recreation. There weren't any of these taken in 1946. I've been places where there's an earthquake, sometimes they'll drop teddy bears, all kinds of things. Wherever there's a national or the bombers will come in and drop goodies for the kids to show they're not forgotten. Here's coming up the back. And they would float down. There's usually a Hershey bar or something like that attached to them. Eventually, he got called in to talk to the CO. And he thought, uh-oh, I'm court-martial. But I haven't any permission to be doing this kind of stuff. Well, the CO said, this is the greatest thing going. The Germans think we are wonderful. The kids are going to grow up thinking Americans are wonderful. And we wish we'd thought of this a lot sooner. Uh, here he's getting letters from the children. And we'll see a few of those. He got bags and bags of thank you letters. 
my face for the sky food. And spread. Donations of candy and parachute materials poured in. Here's Paris bubble gum. The chocolate company railroad cars full. Wrigley's gum sent all kinds of stuff as well. This is gum that he took with him to the polio hospital. Lifesavers, they kicked in. Let us know what you want. This mother wrote in saying, my kids haven't been able to get any of the candy drops because we live too far from the airfield. Their father is gone. I can't help them. I, can you do this for us? And he did. I think he sent them a package through the delivery system. German sharing this. Dropping different things at different places. Some calamity. Uh, they would go in and drop things to the kids to keep their spirits up. Letter from the kids. There's a couple. They'd write in with their drawings. The book is just full of photos and stories about him. Now, this is the one that really makes it my favorite story. This is the ultimate honor for a true hero. He lived near Salt Lake City in 82 or 92. They had the Olympics there, the Winter Olympics. Usually, when your team marches into the stadium with your flag and your all that, you pick up to carry the flag in. It's a, uh, an honor given. Uh, we might pick Wayne Gretzky or a uh, figure skater or something of that sort. Well, at the end, at the days of 2002 Winter Olympic Games approach, the telephone rang. Would you, we would like you to lead the German Olympic team into the stadium in Salt Lake City, Utah. An American lead the German Olympic athletes in. A huge honor. He definitely said yes, and as he's leading them in, holding the flag, he was wondering, some of these are the grandchildren of the kids I dropped candy to. You never know. <sighs> Powerful cartoon. I gotta tell you, Mr. It's just a bunch of numbers. Well, I was about your age when I got it, I kept it as a reminder. A reminder of happier days? No, of a time when the world went mad. Imagine yourself in a land where your countrymen followed the voice of political extremists who didn't like your religion. Imagine every day you, your entire family sent to a concentration camp as slave laborers, then systematically murdered. In this place, they even take your name and replace it with a number tattooed on your arm. It was called the Holocaust when millions of people perished just because of their faith. So you kept it as a reminder to remind yourself about the dangers of political extremism? No, my dear, to remind you. There were some people who did some amazing things and forgotten. I did come across a PBS special on the candy bomber. Detroit. And also, there's a show called Forgotten History, and they take four stories, historical events that I've forgotten all about. Or Good morning, Tom. One of those was the candy bar. So it's starting. This is a that uh, a friend of mine sent to me. It's available for a few days yet, I believe. For $5, you can get two $2 toonies and four quarters with the red poppy on it. That's $5 worth of coins. For five dollars, and it says um, no charge for um, shipping and handling. Five dollars, period. I tried to do it online, and they wanted a charge, so I'm going to call that phone number. But I think these would be great keepsakes, and they're not really that much publicized. Good. Okay, this is something really special, and this will wind things up. There was more that could have been said, but. We've kept you long enough. I want to go back to the beginning here. Come on. <laughs> 
Let's go to Mumbai. Okay. The very last one is a short film clip that the CBC produced. They produced some really wonderful things. And this one is absolutely haunting about Remembrance Day. CBC can do some wonderful stuff. The candy farmer has got to be my favorite story that I've come across in a long time. No, it doesn't want to run it, it skipped over it. Okay. We'll do it this way. I can get it to it's, it's the last picture and it's a film clip. So it's a little different format than the others, and that is the problem. Okay. Here we are. Good morning, shoppers. At 11 o'clock on this 11th day of November, we'd like to invite you to share with us two minutes of silence in honor of our victims. Good morning, shoppers. At 11 o'clock on this 11th day of November, we'd like to invite you to share. They fought and some died for their homeland. They fought and some died. Now it's our land. Look at his little child. There's no fear in her eyes. Could he not show respect for other dads to have died? Take two minutes, would you mind? It's a pittance of time for the boys and the girls who went over. In peace, may they rest. May we never forget why they died. It's a pittance of time. God forgive me for wanting to strike him. Give me strength so as not to be like him. My heart pounds in my breast, fingers pressed to my lips. My throat wants to fall out. My tongue merely resists. Until this I will bide. It's a pittance of time for the boys and the girls who went over. In peace may they rest, may we never forget why they died. It's a pittance of time. battles and fears of their own there's a price to be paid if you go if you stay freedoms are for and one in numerous ways take two minutes but your mind it's a pittance of time for the boys and the girls all over may we never forget our young become vets at the end of the line. It's a convenience of time. It takes courage 
to fight in your own war. It takes courage to fight someone else's war. Our peacekeepers tell of their own thing. Hell, they bring hope to foreign lands that hate mongers and still take to miss what you mind. It's a pittance of time for the boys and the girls who go home. In peacetime, our best still come back.